It has come to my attention that people are actually being inspired by me to study computer science or become software engineers, which is terrifying. So I have a degree in computer science, but I work as a software engineer, which includes, but is not limited to programming. I actually work as a manager now, which includes even less programming, but I digress. So the world of programming is extremely broad, but I get the feeling that most people learn to code with like one thing in mind, usually like websites or video games or whatever. So I figured I'd give a shallow dive on some of the areas of programming, because each of these things is like so deep that you could spend your whole life doing it and never cross over into any of the other fields. So I think I think the term programmer or software engineer is like is too broad and, and kind of paints the wrong picture. Coding is so ubiquitous that I recommend at least being aware of this stuff, even if you're not considering a lifelong career in software. Lifelong career, in, I don't even know if I'm considering a lifelong career in software. Anyway, let's just jump into it. I sound like Philip DeFranco. Let's just jump into it. Anyway, I feel like the easiest place to start with this is YouTube itself, since we're already here. Now, YouTube is owned by Google, but it independently has nearly 2 billion users who come to watch videos every month, which means a quarter of Earth's population watches videos on YouTube. YouTube's headquarters is located in San Bruno, California, and that office holds about 2,000 people. But because Google has offices everywhere and shares a lot of resources through all of its like companies, it's easy to imagine that thousands of engineers have contributed to YouTube's code base over the years. A company like Facebook that has a bit over 2 billion users likes to boast that they have like one engineer per million users, which means there are about 2,000 engineers working on the Facebook product directly. And I think that's a reasonably safe assumption for YouTube as well. I mean, even Yelp, where I used to work had under 100 million users and nearly five engineers by the time I left. So this isn't a wild estimate by any means, but what could 2000 engineers be doing at YouTube? It's just a website, right? People like to make that argument all the time and it really annoys me. Uh, I could build Facebook in a weekend. We don't care, Tristan. We're trying to watch Avengers, jeez. And to be fair, that claim isn't particularly false. Web applications like Facebook and YouTube are not difficult to build superficially in 2018. YouTube is a web application, which just means that it's an application that you use over the internet. But more specifically, it means it comprises a front end and a back end. The front end is the visual component of YouTube. It's what you see. Using only HTML and CSS, you could build an identical looking clone to YouTube but it wouldn't do anything. YouTube has user accounts and video streaming and recommendations. When you click on a video, you're gonna want a video to play. For that, you're gonna need a backend. If the front end is what you see, the back end is what you don't see. The back end of YouTube is responsible for holding those user accounts and storing those videos and streaming those videos. It's also the thing that creates a custom version of YouTube's website so that when I go to my subscriptions page, and you go to your subscriptions page, we see different content. With what we've described so far, we have a janky version of YouTube. We can click on links and watch videos and view images and stuff. This is how the original internet worked, by the way, without the video part. It's just a bunch of hypertext documents linked together with hyperlinks. Hypertext, by the way, is the HT in HTTP and HTML. In order to get dynamic experiences within YouTube, like animations and being able to leave a comment without refreshing the page, you're gonna need JavaScript. JavaScript introduced dynamic behavior to the web back in 1995 with a web browser called Netscape Navigator. 90s kids know what I'm talking about. Now JavaScript is spread like wildfire and people are spending their whole careers doing it. It's like really evolved into like this whole thing. Okay, so with our basic understanding of web applications on the front end and back end, we can essentially build YouTube's MVP, which stands for minimum viable product, by the way. When we type youtube.com into a web browser and hit enter, what we're essentially doing is asking YouTube for its website. And websites are just files that live on someone else's computer. And the internet is just a bunch of computers that can talk to each other. To actually connect these computers and quickly, safely, reliably send data between them is a problem known as computer networking. And there's a whole field for that. And programmers work on that too. They typically work at internet service providers, ISPs, companies like Comcast and AT&T that provide the infrastructure that make the internet possible. But some also work at companies like Google where they make Google's internal computers communicate more efficiently. So anyway, our basic version of YouTube was not particularly difficult to build, but now we have to grow it and maintain it because there's a ton of websites on the internet. You don't just make the second most popular website in the world by just like making the website and like putting it out there. There's millions of those. Essentially every piece that we've described of the YouTube application can have like infinite depth and nuance to it and it can hook into completely different fields of computer science like artificial intelligence. There's this thing called the law of diminishing returns and it comes into play here. God, I sound so 
boring. Is this video boring? Let me know in the comments down below. Anyway, the law of diminishing returns says that you'll get less and less return on investment for the same resources. It's like that Buzzfeed show worth it where they try food at three different price points, like $2 versus $2,000 pizza. Turns out that $2,000 pizza isn't a thousand times as good as $2 pizza. There's no way we could have known that. And there's another thing happening here. And I don't know if there's like a law for this, but I saw a really good analogy. Essentially like a gallon of water is like really easy to hold, but like millions of gallons of water require like a bunch of infrastructure in order to hold all that water in one place. So that's also what's happening here. Anyway, going back to YouTube, it's going to take more and more resources to make YouTube better and better. We're going to need a lot more resources to support 2 billion users than our like one man show here. And we've also got to like do research and development and build new products. We'll need people to babysit the computers that YouTube is running on because they will literally overheat and die if no one pays attention to them. Then you're going to need people implementing experiments on the platform to learn new ways to make it better, which means you're going to need a way to collect data from user behavior. And then you need to store and process that. What if I'm in Japan and my favorite cat video is in the US? It actually takes much longer for a computer in Japan to talk to a computer in the States than it would if those computers were in the same country. So maybe I want to make it so that there's copy of my cat video in the US and Japan. Ads are a thing. Let's make money with ads. But what ads do we put in front of what videos? That's a team right there. Now creators can make money on the platform. Great, but we're gonna need a way for those creators to pay out. So we're gonna have to like work with banks and payment systems. Wait, now you can make money on YouTube? Great, I'm a bad guy and I'm just gonna like make a bot that watches the ads on my own videos. So that's fraud and that's illegal, but we have to be the ones to catch it or else no advertisers are gonna wanna work with us and we can't make money. So now we need a team to fight fraud. Maybe we get more people engaging with the platform if we recommended videos to watch instead of just serving them a static homepage. How are we gonna do that? Well, with help from the artificial intelligence community. They're over there teaching programs how to learn from their mistakes. It's apparently called machine learning. Great, let's hire some engineers who know about machine learning so they can teach a program about our users so that we can recommend new cat videos for them to watch. While we're at it, let's get some of those people to work on our ads. Oh, and we're gonna need analytics dashboards so that we can figure out how our metrics are going. Whoa, I don't know how to analyze that data. Can we hire a data scientist? They can write programs that run analysis on our data and teach us things. Oh crap, now we're too popular and we have too much data for us to process. It's just too big. That's where data engineers come in. They can use advanced techniques for processing very large sets of data efficiently. We need mobile apps. They're all the rage now, right? Yeah, gotta get some people to build those. Now our backend that previously only had to talk to our website has to talk to mobile clients as well. And now we're probably gonna need people to oversee and design a way for our, our web and our mobile apps to talk to the same backend. That's called an API. Oh no, everything is breaking. Why is that? I don't know, people, aren't perfect, I guess, and the code they're writing has mistakes in it that we don't notice until millions of people use the code in ways we didn't expect. Oh yeah, you're gonna wanna test your code. Wait, so I have to write code to make sure that my code is doing what it's supposed to do? Yeah. That's so meta. And that's just YouTube. Maybe the internet isn't your thing and you'd rather play video games. I hear Fortnite's pretty cool. How'd they do that? Lots of math and computer graphics. Also networking for multiplayer. Gross. How about my microwave? A programmer also worked on this. It's an embedded system, which means low-level code lives inside a chip inside of the microwave. Strange. How about my Google Home? Internet of things. That's a combination of embedded systems and pretty much everything I said about YouTube's backend. VR? Everything I said about graphics and math but more graphics and math. Operating systems? Don't even get me started. All right, that's about all I had for today. I just wanted to make a quick video this morning because uh, I felt like it. Expect some exciting things next week. Please like this video, comment on it, share it with a friend, subscribe, hit the bell, all that jazz. I'll see you next week.